A client with MS, for example, has real difficulty walking, has to use a, a wheelchair when she's out and about. One of the things that she was finding very hard was walking up the stairs. We did lots of things. It wasn't one thing. We were working on opening up her visual field and giving her targets to move towards. She said, I can't believe how simple this is, but again, how well it works. Quite soon, she was able to walk up the stairs without holding on to the rails. So it's just things like that that can have a huge impact in people's lives. And she said, I don't worry about the future like I used to worry. I was so surprised that I could do these things. The way we experience the world and move through it safely is by using our senses. So it stands to reason that when we have issues with our movement, we should look at those sensory systems that are involved to see if we can make changes that help. My guest today, Amanda Kemp, is a Pilates teacher who, through both personal interest and working with clients with physical limitations, decided to deepen her understanding of how the senses affect our movement. She shares this interesting viewpoint about how the senses affect our movement, examples of some of the changes she's seen in her clients since putting her training into practice, and gives us some brilliant practical examples to help us better understand the way she works and how it might be relevant for all of us. You've been a Pilates teacher for nearly 20 years but you're now a Pilates teacher with a difference as you've also trained in neurological techniques that use our sensory systems which I would imagine is less well known about. We'll come on to why you chose to add in this training but to start with please can you describe the sensory systems that affect our movement and the interaction between the brain and the body? Okay, yes. So the um, three key sensory systems are proprioception, visual and vestibular. Um, people might have heard a bit more or be a bit familiar with proprioception, but not so much in terms of movement, visual and vestibular. Um, so just to explain... Well, just to yeah. <laughs> yes, I was going to say, because actually, yeah. actually the word proprioception, um, until I um, got into movement, I had no idea what that meant, to be honest. So yeah. it's definitely worth explaining. OK, so proprioception is um, being aware of where our bodies are in space. So um, f feeling what we feel through the skin, muscles, our joints. Um, and that is actually a bit of an unreliable sense in some ways um, because it can give us information that isn't necessarily correct. So I don't know about you, but I know in the past I would have um, been correcting people like if they're off alignment and get them into correct, in inverted commas, alignment. Um, and then they say, oh, that feels really off because their proprioception yeah. was telling them something different so that's what I mean about we might think that we know where we are in space but actually we don't always actually know uh, where we are um, so does that make sense about proprioception it does and actually um, I think we'll come on to talk about it later but mm -hmm. I have personal experience of that because of um, my hypermobility yeah. that actually means that that sort of skill for me is a little bit off it's got a bit of a gray area and therefore I've got a, a memory of a Pilates teacher sort of saying to me now lie in a straight line uh, with closed eyes and she sort of came along and adjusted me so much that I felt like I was straight and then she put me in a sort of banana shape mm. and in fact she'd made she'd made me straight mm. so that's kind of like the perfect you, example yeah where yeah but not for a clue, your, unless I look in a mirror yeah and for your brain, when you were corrected, that actually felt wrong. So um, it did. So that's what I mean about proprioception can actually be a little bit unreliable. So we don't necessarily want to um, use that as the only um, sensory right. tool. Um, and typically, in a lot of movement practices, or just in daily life generally, we tend to really use that. Um, yeah. And the other two can really change our proprioception and change our movement patterns so the visual system as as it suggests is the information coming through the eyes to the brain but it's a lot more than just what we see so 
Um, there are eye abs, like we have abdominal abs, and they have to, oh. um, yeah, so they need to work to move your eyes around. Um, but we're, we're having to navigate the world and take in all this information through the eyes. So the brain is really doing all these kind of very, very quick um, processes of the information that, that's coming through. Uh, for example, if you're walking along a street, you've got people coming towards you. So your eyes are having to uh, converge and make sure they can do that. There might be something in your peripheral vision. Um, you might need to um, use your eyes to keep your focus on something. Um, so, yeah, that's just one example of how the the, the yeah. visual system is a lot more than just seeing something you know like when you go to the opticians and they're testing your sight it's it's more than that yeah in all the information that's coming through the eyes um and then you've got yeah. the vestibular system which is essentially the um these three semicircular canals in the ear and that's c controlling your balance and um so if your vestibular system is maybe a little bit off, you might feel dizzy when when your head moves, or if you don't like going um, on roller coasters or on a boat, for example, it makes you feel a bit off. That might suggest there's a little dysfunction with your vestibular system. So okay, we can use all of those systems to help us um, move. Um, just in our daily life, but also if you are doing a more athletic movement, um, it really can apply to anything. And so um, I suppose if you were listening, you might kind of think, well, yes. And doesn't that all kind of happen automatically? But I suppose um, from sort of what you're saying, lots of little issues came up in my head with where things aren't quite going right and yet because we're not sort of focusing on a system or, or we can't because it's so internal mm -hmm. bringing our awareness to knowing whether those things are working well or not is without someone like you or whatever is nigh on impossible for us to realize that that thing is out of whack and how that might affect our movement mm. one of the one of the things that came to mind when you were talking was um that um when someone is off balance because for example they have crystals in their ear and then that takes them off or they have an infection that affects that vestibular system and they and so labyrinthitis or something or a virus that can make them go off and then they've got a really clear example mm. that it's going wrong mm. but when it's not as clear when it's smaller it must be harder to, to detect but also we just I don't know that many people think about it particularly. No. Uh, it's not something I've heard of that you would train in. Is, no. is that fair to say? Yeah, I think so. And um, I think you're right. It's not until you have an issue with something, so, so something is taken away, then you realise, oh, well, I, I was relying on that. A bit like you were saying when somebody corrected you into a more yeah. straight alignment, that that was your um, your thing that was taken away. And while we're on the subject of hypermobility, you you will see people making compensations. We all have them. So nobody has a perfect gait cycle, for example. And um, say for somebody that when they stand up, they're always hyperextending their knees. So rather than yeah. me saying, don't hyperextend your knees because their brain has chosen that, it's it thinks it's safe to be in that position. You could look at the whole system. So you might look at their ankle range of movement can they work on hip extension but also what is going on with their visual system so rather than taking away that strategy that they've got to stand up we're going to look right. at other things going on in the body that so change the sensory information maybe that the brain is getting um, and then we're not saying we're not going to then look at improving the alignment. Of course, we always want to get, you know, to stop the knee extension in that case and improve things. But it's not about taking it away because then that's like saying to somebody that's walking with a stick, right now I'm going to take the stick away and walk. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. yeah. No, that's a great way to put it. I, that, that makes absolute sense. So, and then 
So if you were doing that, let's just take the case of me um, and, mm. um, and, and my legs that did go backwards, which then materially affected the way I was um, stacked from then on up in the body, mm. which could have been a big contributing factor to my chronic pain for years because my pelvis could have been completely out of line the entire time. My brain didn't yeah. know where it was at. Yeah. So I had a certain type of treatment, but no one ever said to me, um, let's look at your vestibular, let's think about your vestibular system or your visual system, N not at any point. Yeah. So if someone came into your studio and you uh, said, I I'm hypermobile, or you could see that that was an issue, um, what would you then do with them? Well, with anyone coming in, I, and this is the beauty of it, because it's not like there's a script that I have, to, okay, for someone with hypermobility, you must do this. For somebody with this condition, you must do this. Because everybody is unique. And so whoever's coming in, I would just get them moving and just like observe them from the moment they come in the door. How are they walking? Um, are they, you know, are they fidgeting? Are they twitching? Are their eyes darting around, which might suggest that they can't go stabilize? Um, how, so how are they moving naturally? And then just get them into a movement, start them moving, which a lot of people struggle with because they're like well what do you want you know where do you want me to move from? from me what do yeah. you want me to and I'm just like just roll <laughs> over and then roll back onto your back um yeah. and so so I'm really observing everything and like from the from the top down and then I would um think about what I'm seeing and then just try something so I would just okay what about if you now did this for example look at what happens with that see how the movement changes and if you get a good response with that, then you're going to repeat that and repeat that, making sure that they're moving in that that new way in that safe range. Because if we're looking to make a, a change in movement for the better or, or any change, um, it has to be deemed to be safe and you want to repeat that movement so the brain learns it. And that's that's neuroplasticity. But that is banded around quite a lot. Like you must do this for neuroplasticity. And I think a lot of people can go wrong because um, they think I've just got to do all these reps. Just just keep repping. But if you're not actually changing the output by what information is coming in through the brain, through any of those systems, then you're not actually going to get a long term change. You're just going to reinforce the way you've always been moving. So for you. For example, um, just something really simple, like sitting as we are now, if you were to, to do a hip hinge, which is where you're going to keep a, so I'm sitting upright, I've got a uh, neutral spine and, and I'm, I'm upright, but not forced. And then I'm just going to lean forward. So this is a hip yes. hinge moving the, the pelvis around the legs and then, then coming back up. So whoever is doing this movement, and whether people want to do this now or after, they can you know yeah. try it. We, um, and yeah. or everyone will do something different. So you might have somebody that overextends in their lower back, and it's all the movement is coming from there. You might find that somebody I can't turn to the side very well because of these uh, is over, you know all coming from their neck, overextending yes. their neck. Right. Um, yep. So there's various cues that I might give that client to see if they can just do the movement uh, without those other weird things going on. For example, if you're, um, well, yeah, we'll do it seated. You're going to just gaze down with your eyes. So find a target and it can't just be a blank. You just even like I'm looking at a mark on my table. And I'm going yep. to bring myself as close as I can towards that as I do that movement. And then I'm going to come away from that. So that's giving your brain a visual cue to do the movement. Now we could, we could go to, if I, if I looked at that person and saw, for example, um, they were really rounding their back to, to get there. So rather than staying in a neutral and folding, they were all, all from the shoulders rounding or equally hyperextending their lower back to do the movement. I could say, right, put your hands on your bum cheeks. And it's even better to go 
under your clothes, onto the skin, so you can feel the skin with your fingers. Uh, and if anyone's not comfortable with that, fine, they can just go on, on the you know lower back, right down by the sacrum, where you can feel that bony bit, and then your fingertips mm. will be on the flesh. So I want you to try and lift that skin up even before you move, and that's going to encourage the brain to know that that's the direction mm. we want to go. So that's hopefully giving you a proprioceptive cue through the skin, helping you to get that movement mm. of the pelvis around the legs. So it really it's depends such, on what I see. Yeah. And, and then just, you know, trying this, let's see if it has an effect for the better. Great. Um, carry on. If not, I just say, okay, now try this and give a different cue. But it's a great, it, that's a great example, particularly for me, because I talk about hip hinge a lot. And oh, do I do a lot of hip hinging in my class, yeah. Huh. Um, um, to, to get up and down from the ground, um, to do sitting, chair sitting and getting out of technique and so on. Um, but it's so interesting that because those cues you're giving are to people who, haven't got the proprioception to know what their body's doing in the movement but the cues you're giving are not kind of saying well just adjust it and or just do as I'm doing mm. because quite frankly they can't because they don't know that they're not in the first place so yeah. that's you know the the, the uh, visual cue is very really interesting because you're just adding in that bit more information and then that touching the skin particularly on the lower back so you can really feel almost the angle mm. that your back is at and therefore you get a bit extra it's a bit like when um uh years ago someone said to me if you're wanting to get those glutes working and feel them then tap them mm. so that you can then sort of have the memory of that tapping sensation in your brain and that really resonated for me and I use that with other people as well. No, I'm fascinated. So I'm going to, uh, after this conversation, I'm going to have to get all of your tips. <laughs> what are all your cues, please? Just, yeah. just all, you know, all your training in 20 minutes, please. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's really fascinating. So the cues then are, so if someone doesn't feel they're in or, or doesn't appear to be in the, in, in, um, the alignment they think they are, mm. then you're using the other senses, mm -hmm. bringing in cues for the other senses. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's really interesting. And you talked about neuroplasticity just to really um, help listeners understand what what does neuroplasticity blah, blah, neuroplasticity mean, um, and particularly in this context. Okay, so neuroplasticity is our or well, the brain's ability to change, and um, we with movement, everybody gets stuck in our movement patterns and then people typically come to me because they're in pain or you know they might have a neurological condition I do work with people with that and that's why I started going down this route of training but what I realized is because everyone has a brain it, it works for everyone the techniques are very simple but effective so um we all have our, our movement patterns we get stuck in those movement patterns and if we want to change that movement pattern, we need to show the brain that there's a new way and the brain needs to feel safe. I mean, it, it is really that simple. The safety comes first. So even if you want to do something uh, really passionately, your brain is not going to let that happen. And you, you can't override that unless it feels safe. So we use those sensory systems to show it that something is available there is something else available so in the example of the knees hyperextending this isn't the only thing that's available we can move your pelvis around your legs if we use that visual cue you can do it um so and it can go both ways like we can learn bad new movement patterns or we can learn good new movement patterns but typically we really need to show something the brain that is new and then the brain nearly really needs to be paying attention to that. So I often say to people, if I give them um, a few things to practice at home, which could be something like that hip hinge we just did, whether you're standing or sitting, pick a target, hinge towards that, and then away from it. So it's all about that, that visual system. Now, there's no point in doing that if you're not actually using the cue and paying attention. So 
don't don't just think like I'm going to watch TV and then do do this movement because if your brain isn't paying attention, we're not then repatterning or reprogramming the brain to that pattern. Does that make sense? Yes, no, that absolutely makes sense. And it's about this sort of um, intentional movement. So it's coming away from the body's autopilot and moving towards showing it that if we moving this way, using the intention, using the various systems, mm. then it's going to embed more easily and and, and practicing it. So mm. the consistency of doing it regularly, which I think is something that people don't really want to hear yes. <laughs> because there's so, so much quick fix culture out there and, yes. you know, so many messages on, on social platforms and saying, you know, do these five things three times a week and boom, yes. you're done, you're sorted. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and I really struggle with those messages because I was in pain for years trying everything and very little, you know, it took yeah. a long time for anything to work. And yeah. when it did work, it was about me doing move very basic developmental patterns um which i'm sure there was quite a bit of overlap with what you were talking about but i wasn't aware mm. um but i had to do it repeatedly and repeatedly and yes. I, I nearly i was in a in a gym at the time and i i felt like such a sort of fraudulent gym goer because there was never any sweat um and i was always on this mat with bits of equipment and i felt like getting a t-shirt printed saying don't judge me i'm in rehab because <laughs> yeah. i was there for so long doing the same thing over and over but that's what your brain needs yeah to learn yeah yeah and actually if i mean it sounds like you got that anyway but if you were working with that newer approach you wouldn't have had to be doing loads and loads of reps because actually you could just spend a little bit of time repping so and it's like you could do three to five to ten of the movement um but because your brain is paying attention it's got it in there and then let that simmer away and then a bit later in the day you can do it a bit more yeah that's why i always say to people don't feel you've got to you know do everything that i'm doing with you in this class or this one-to-one -one, yeah. um at home i send people away with a bit like i just did a little drill that you can incorporate a bit like brushing your yeah. teeth, you know, just do it three times a day, more if you can, if you're, you know, if you sat down, you haven't been moving, add this move, movement or the drill in. Um, but I agree with you. It's very frustrating when you see, um, just do these exercises for this. Um, just do these reps uh, because it actually goes down to the fundamentals and it is those small, slow, paying attention movements um done well and then repeating them which nobody really wants to do but then once you start to feel the difference in your body you're like well okay yes i'm 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 going to Absolutely. carry that on yeah yeah because it, it talking about brushing teeth again it's a bit like going to the dentist you're not going to do nothing in between those visits and just expect it all to be fine so you've got to do every day brush your teeth and then whenever you go it's it's the checkup so like coming to me is a bit like the dentist visit and then you go home and you're doing your your daily things um yeah so yeah no that's it, a nice way of putting yeah. it it can be um i think people are, su are surprised at um how simple but effective it can be so the foundations have to be in place. That's the other thing I wanted to say because you can get very excited about the visual or the vestibular cues and think, right, well, I'm just going to start doing these. But you need to be careful that you have got those foundations in place as well. So, you know, your spine is holding you up. You are stable around your hips and your shoulders. And um, and then if you've got that in place, then you're adding those other bits on top and then it, it all kind of integrates through the brain. Uh, but something really simple that you can just hopefully understand what I mean is, again, just can be done sitting in a chair. You're going to slide one leg straight out to the side of you, bring it back in and, and keep doing that. So I'm going to do this as I talk. Mm -hmm. And then rather than thinking about that moving leg, just glance down at your other leg and notice what that one's doing. So it might be going in the direction of the moving leg or it might be slightly going out the other way. And so do you mean the the knee? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've got my, for example, left leg is sliding out to the side and back in, and I'm looking at my knee on my right leg. And if I see any slight movement to the right or left, then I can use a cue to help stabilize that non-moving side of my body. So by getting that foundation of stability, I can then improve the movement from a stable base. So I what could... What would the cue be? Yeah, okay. So there could be... Uh, <laughs> Tell me the cue. And uh, you could look at your knee, literally look at it, and just try and keep it still. So that's using your visual system. Right. Or you could go to um, using a pressure cue, which is really good at speaking to the brain. You could put your right hand on the outside of your right leg or on the inside. And you could you could try both. Okay. And feel the pressure of your hand against your leg. Your leg is going to push into your hand slightly. So you get a little bit of, we're not, you know, gripping but a little bit of connection yeah yeah and then notice what happens there in terms of that pressure as your other leg is sliding so then what you're going to try and do is if you notice a slight change in pressure then try and maintain that so that's using a proprioceptive pressure cue which is giving information to your brain to help stabilize that side of your body Mm. It's so logical. Mm, I it's know. So, it's, 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 re- it's really simple, but it's really logical. And it's just, it's just a different viewpoint. And once you understand this interplay between the senses and the way you move and how your brain works, even to the level that we've discussed today, it just makes mm. so much sense. Mm, mm. So tell me, tell me about your journey into it then. Why did you, um, how did you come across this um, way of training and, and why did you uh, decide to, to do it? Yeah, so I'd obviously been working already um, in the area of movement and I just coincidentally had um, some clients with more uh, challenging neurological issues. So I had a few people with multiple sclerosis. I had a client, a couple of clients actually with Parkinson's. And um, I just thought, I feel like I need to know a bit more about this. I felt like, you know, the typical approach wasn't necessarily giving them the results that they wanted or I wanted. And then alongside that, my dad himself has lived with MS uh, for many years. And um, I came across uh, this training through the Neuro Studio. So very happy to give the Neuro Studio a shout out. Did um, training with them. Um, they explain this in a huge amount more depth than me. And, um, yeah, so I, I learned from them and then just started incorporating these techniques into the way I work with people and saw really positive results. For example, um, I'm just thinking about a few clients. So, um, a client with MS, for example, um, has um, real difficulty walking, has to use a, a wheelchair when she's out and about. One of the things that she was finding very hard was walking up the stairs, just up and down her stairs at home. So we did lots of things. It wasn't one thing, but one of her, um, and the, the Neuro Studio call these little um, homework exercises, really, the little drills, they call them daily movement activators because it's the things that you can do or that you need to do to get your body moving. So rather than thinking of it like homework, it's just a quick thing that you do. Um, Anyway, so her, one of those was um, using her eyes. So we were working on opening up her visual field and giving her targets to move towards. Because when you have MS and in her case in particular, she um, really didn't have much feeling down the right side of her body. And this can be the case. She might have one side of the body that is a lot weaker, that doesn't have um, much sensation. Some people can't really feel their feet. So why are we relying on proprioceptive cues if they can't really feel their feet? So um, for her, we had a huge amount of success with the eyes. So now what she does is, and she was just so amazed. She said, I can't believe how how simple this is, but again, how well it works. So whenever she walks up the stairs now, she just gives herself targets. So when she's at the bottom of the stairs, 
she's looking at a target and then she's moving up towards that. And then when she's in line with that, she jumps the eyes up and then gives herself a new target. So then quite soon she's able she was able to walk up the stairs without um holding on to the rails. So it's just things like that wow. that can have a huge impact in people's lives. And a huge impact in terms of their physical ability to do it, but also their confidence and yeah. the sort of empowerment yeah. when you're in a situation yeah. where your your body's just not, you know, it's a frustrating thing when your body's not doing yeah. what you want it to do or you're in pain. It's much more of a, yes. a sort of a mental battle than a physical in a way. And, and I, to give her that, that's such a gift. Yeah, and that's what I feel. That's really what makes it so joyful for me that it is giving people hope even those people who feel like they haven't got any left, you know, they've tried a lot of things, they've done what everyone said, and they're, they're still not really able to do the things they want to do. So um, I love this story about her because she last year was um, going on a family holiday. It was this big holiday. They were going off to Morocco to do all these activities. And before she went, she said, I'm really, really worried about going. I'm not sure if I can go. Like, it was a group activity holiday. She was so nervous about holding everyone back and is she going to be able to walk? It's going to be different terrain. What's it going to be like? And it was so lovely when she got back that she was just over the moon and she said, it's been so emotional. My daughters were crying. I was crying. And, and she was oh. saying to me, I really feel like um, I don't worry about the future like I used to worry. I was so surprised that I could do these things. And she said, I was on the bus and they'd gone off for a walk, but I stayed on the bus and I was doing some of my eye exercises. And then we went on to do the next thing. And, um, yeah. you know, she, she went on a so camel. She, could... she, she, she took part. And, um, yeah, exactly. that was she was really... taking part in life. Yes. Yeah, really she, and, encouraging. And she did, she did what the things that she wanted to do within her uh, boundaries, but she made choices about what she wanted to do rather than her limitations sort of imposing or feeling yeah. like they're imposing negative um, choices. Yeah. yeah, and her well, daughters said to such her, a wonderful story. Yeah, it is lovely, I, and that's why I like to share it because her daughters were saying to her, "Oh, mum, you're so amazing. You know, life can be really hard when we're having to navigate things at home." But she said, "This has just been really amazing." So that's that's very encouraging. Um, and then just yeah. for, like I said, it doesn't have to be just for people with a, a neuro condition. Although, again, yeah. I've had great success and working with a lovely man with um, motor neuron disease which is a horrible disease and really takes away so much movement but he, even he was really surprised recently when um, he, he can't really lift his arm and he thought I was lifting it for him and I had to show it no I'm not doing this for you but we I, I, I held my hand above his hand so we'd already tested, right, can you lift your arm at all? Can you hold something and lift it? No, that wasn't happening. And I said, right, now can you look at my finger? And you're going to look back down to your finger. So we did some eye movement from my finger to his finger. And then I said, keep looking at my finger, which was above his hand. I said, now can you keep looking at my finger and bring your hand up towards it? I think it was that way around. Or it might have been looking at his finger and bringing his finger up to mine. But either way one of those cues yeah. work Try. and he was yeah. like I can't believe that is that magic I said no look it, it's just happened <laughs> so we've we've gone through the the visual system um to help now of course we're not going to stop the development of any disease but hopefully and I've seen yeah, it, it, can, it can keep the disability at bay for as long as possible if you're consistent getting the brain yeah. to pay attention we and so just, much more so I like the hope you were talking about, the positivity, the the wanting to to get out and be involved in life. Those that these are all mm. massive, massive things. It's yes. fantastic. Yeah. Do you have do you have any examples where so we talked a lot about visual cues, mm -hmm. but for vestibular, how how would you use the vestibular system to help with um any uh, other things? Have you got any examples? Yeah, so um vestibular, vestibular, let me think. Um I would, so a good one you can do, for example, is with the vestibular system, like I said, it's a, um, the semicircular canals, you've got fluid in the ear, that's kind of moving around. So what you could do 
say for example the visual cue wasn't the right cue for a person proprioceptive wasn't effective i might say to them or if i notice for example that they close their eyes automatically in a movement because yeah. i know that's something yeah. that i tend to do quite a lot i would let them keep their eyes closed and then bring in a vestibular cue so with your eyes closed if you're comfortable but people don't have to have their eyes closed just if we take the visual information away then we're focused a lot more on the vestibular so imagine you've got a cup of tea sat in your head and you're going to just spill a little bit of that tea out of one ear and then out of the other mm -hmm. and that's all you're doing just spilling a little drop of tea and then you could even go the other way so you're going to bring it to spill down the front of your body and then down the back Ooh. so that's obviously okay. working your vestibular system and then you can use that as a cue so for example now i would like you to think about that cup of tea like it's balancing on a tray in your head and now you can't spill a drop of that tea and then okay. we could do a movement for example can you lift your right arm up above your head and back down you're not really thinking about the arm you're thinking about not spilling a cup of tea in your head your tea. yeah ah, okay so you know it could be a leg movement we could go back to that leg slide out to the side can you do the leg yeah. slide without spilling any of your tea so the primary yeah. sensory information that we were using there was the vestibular system Oh, brilliant. Oh, it's amazing. And then and then with balance um, as well, because mm. obviously that's something that um, can be really affected by a lot of the conditions you discussed, but also just people generally mm -hmm. um, as they age and so on. One of the things I was going to um, ask you about, um, and balance is just one specific example, is when one of those systems is going anyway. So, for example, your eyesight's off. Um, and you've not got corrective you know, or the corrective isn't quite enough or whatever, mm. or you you have deteriorating hearing as you age. Can you kind of compensate for those things by working on the other sensory systems? Yeah, definitely. So with the example of, um, so say you don't have vision or you've got reduced vision in yeah. your right eye, things may feel very unsafe going over to the right. For example, your rotation to the right might not be as, um, as free-flowing. The range of movement might not be as big. So, okay, we're not going to use the visual system. We could go to some um, bring an awareness to what you feel on that side of your face. So you could like maybe stroke... Mm the side of your face or um, give yourself a bit of a head massage on that side or um, just press your hand into your head there. So you're creating that little bit of feedback. So now your brain knows where this side of your face is. And then you're going to do your rotation and maintain, I'm holding onto my head and keep holding onto my head there. Um, and the teacher that I work with, I, I've seen her do this before. She said she um, had a, you know how you get these weighted vests? Well, yeah. she had a weighted headband um, and she yeah. just put it on one side. I think this was for someone who had a, a, a sight issue on, on that side. So that just gave some feedback, made that person feel safe. And then that helped the movement. Um, but with balance, so sorry. I just wanted to say no, no, go with on. balance because I, I find this quite frustrating. So because every most people come to me and balance is one of the things they want to improve, particularly as they get older. And they say things to me like, yeah, I'm, I'm standing on one leg while I'm brushing my teeth. And I think, well, that's only going to reinforce you standing on one leg while you're brushing your teeth. And balance is so much more than just practicing standing on one leg. And we can practice balance Still. sitting in a chair. <laughs> yeah, we can practice balance lying on one side, down on the floor. Um, so, yeah, like, can you, um, like we did with that arm movement, for example, go to a visual cue. Can you keep looking at that visual cue and just move your arm? 
or move your leg, for example. So that would be the visual cue. Are people who feel unbalanced when they get out of bed in the morning, which again can be quite common the older we get. So even before you get out of bed, you could work on um, using the eyes. So there's something called a uh, vestibular ocular reflex, which is a reflex that keeps your eyes in focus when your head is moving. So there's a couple right. of ways we could think about that. If you stick your thumb out in front of you, you're going to look at your mm -hmm. thumb, keep your eyes on the thumb, and then just move your head up and down. Or your head could be moving side to side, cool. but that's that's using vestibular ocular reflex. So for someone that's lying in bed and has struck, maybe struggling to get up, feeling off balance, so you're lying on your back, you bring your arm up, stick your thumb up in front of you. And if they can't lift their arm, they can maybe just look up at a target on the ceiling. A dot. Yeah. 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 And that they're, they're going to lift their head up and not off the pillow, but just kind of tilt it back and yeah. keeping their eyes on the spot. So if I come really close, if I'm looking at spot and I tilt my head backwards, that's yeah. actually encouraging my eyes to track down so yeah we're um we're going to do that and then from there you're going to try and roll yourself up so you're going to lift your head um off the off the bed look down towards another target that might be down by your feet and then you're going to try and bring yourself as close as you can towards that so you're doing this is a classical pilates exercise mm. a roll up roll but with you yep give a ocular reflex to open up the visual field and then we're using a target moving towards that target towards and if somebody can't roll up you can still do it for example you're looking at your thumb you're going and actually to... get up any way they want i mean it doesn't yeah, actually matter keep, how they get up looking. as long as they're locking in yes. yeah keep follow the thumb so you could do it as an eye tracking yeah. so while you're lying there you could see if your eyes can smoothly track your thumb and you would be surprised at how many people can't do this without their Difficult. head moving yeah. or, or go to the VOR. So you're going to look at the thumb, keep your eyes on it and just move your head, which is, again, it's encouraging the movement of the eyes without the head moving. When you've done that, say three times, just three times of that, then start moving that thumb out to the side. You're going to follow it to take you into that rolling onto your side and then you can push yourself up. Keep looking at the thumb. So your brain is focused. So you're not worrying about, oh, where am I putting my hands? Where is the floor? Your brain is focused yeah. on that. That's brilliant. Oh, it's so <laughs> practical. And, I, and, and uh, you know, I am going to be trying this a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you should do the days, course. <laughs> I know, it's, yeah. it's fascinating. Yeah. It really is. And I love the, uh, as I said before, I love the simplicity of it. And, um, and the eye thing really resonates because often um, when I speak to people about um, moving your eye muscles, working your eye muscles, in other words, um, you know, we'll do a move where we twist around to the side and then I'll say, and, and allow your eyes to keep going, but not your neck to try and sort of almost exercise the eyes. Um, and when I say to people, if you know, during the day, think about how much you're moving your whole body to look around mm -hmm. rather than using your eyes. And, and it's, it's this kind of thing where we go to the easiest um, yeah. thing we can do with the body. We go on to autopilot. So instead of looking over um, and, and trying to see, we shift everything. Yes. And therefore we start to use the eyes less. So an and eye health is you know, multifaceted, but one of them is, is making sure those muscles yeah. are moving properly, isn't it? Ultimately? Uh, yes, so, you're, you're entirely right. And I think sometimes people's range of movement or let's say movement restriction isn't really anything so physical. If you can just open up their visual field, like you're saying, maybe they just, their, their daily movement thing could be just doing some yeah. eye tracking, like pick up a pen yeah. and can you track that? without moving your head so now your eyes know that they can do this move yes so we could actually practice this here so as we're sitting here if you just um turn... I, I just have to put a caveat i am standing 
Okay, you can. Just, <laughs> I haven't admitted you it, like but I am actually standing. <laughs> okay, yeah, you're you're standing. Go on. Okay. I'm sitting. We can do it either way. Yeah. So you're yeah. going to turn to the right. Just turn naturally to the right, and just take note of what you end up looking at. So we're just going to experience where you turn to. Come back to center. Now take your right thumb out in front of you. You're going to stare at your thumb. Turn your head to the left, and then back to the thumb three times. Am I still looking at the thumb? Yes. Keep your eyes on the thumb. Oh, yeah. Yeah, not very far. Oh, that no, that's felt fine. restrictive. No, that's fine. Now okay. keep looking at that. Uh, no, sorry, bring the thumb down and then do your rotation to the right again and tell me if it feels it's gone, whether it's gone any further. Or... Further. Yes. Definitely further. Okay. So oh, no. for you then. Definitely. To improve your range of movement in your rotation to the right, one of your yep. daily movement practices could be doing a, uh, um, I can't remember the word, the, um, <laughs> Th the thumb thingy. The thumb thingy. <laughs> the VOR, the vestibular ocular reflex to I the left. I could have helped there, but I yeah. So, okay. uh, move, so to ah, improve to your rotation to the right, you're going to look at the right. spot or look at your thumb and turn your head to the left, which is encouraging your eyes to track to the right. So, and when you then ro rotate to the right, that improves. Now, if that hadn't improved for you, we could have Whoa. moved the eyes and the head in a different way to um, find an improvement in your rotation. And then your, your homework practice would be working on that. Yeah. Love it. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. I really do. I think it's it's so it's it's super clever. And I can see how if you feel like you've got that little bit of change there and then, then that's impetus to keep trying and yeah. seeing what more you can do. But it also gives you that information about your own movement patterns. So knowing where your body is in space, but mm. also just realizing, oh actually I have got a limitation you know particularly comparing one side to the other where yes. often um we don't realize it quite so much and yet because we're very one-handed one-sided mm. uh, in, in a lot of our movements we're actually quite limited in the other way and that's really a great way to sort of test it and see that and make yeah. the comparison to see yeah. if you could do a bit more work yes and the body and I always think of sorry I was just going to say, and I always think of practical things. I, uh, one of the things we do in my classes is called the reverse parking move because um, my mum named it as such, where we're posting hands behind and we're twisting through the shoulders and then we're looking behind, but we're not stretching with the neck. And yeah. we're looking around, trying to get this movement in the upper torso, into the shoulders, because again, when we lose that level of twist, then we can't, you know, and, and if the yeah. neck's getting tighter, then can't yeah, see them yeah, and you yeah. can't reverse park anymore yeah. and then we're reliant on beepers and cameras and things and if you don't have them you're stuffed so yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um we tend to move like where our body makes or brain makes choices where it wants to move easily yeah so an proprioceptive cue you could use with that one could be something as simple as mm. you go into your rotation let them rotate as much as they want to and then say to them right it's really difficult with these headphones but i try the best um you've gone into your rotation now just drop your head, drop your chin a little bit and see, is your chin in line with your sternum, with your breastbone? So you could put your yeah. finger and thumb, finger under your chin, find your sternum with your, find your breastbone with your mm. thumb. So if your chin has gone further around, then you're going to bring your chin all the way back in line with your sternum. You can right. use the finger yes. and thumb to make sure. Then say to them. I love that. Just look over to the right with your eyes. So whatever mm. you're looking at now, bring your finger and thumb and your whole body will come with to what you're looking at. So you've found your target and then you're going to try and line up with that target. So we're still keeping everything in line. Then you've discovered how much rotation your lumbar spine maybe can do, not just up in your neck. And then if you're comfortable yeah. there, can your eyes go a bit more around to the right, find another target, just comfortably gazing over there and then can your spine get even further in line and sometimes people are really surprised oh I've gone that far but like you said it's not just pulling your neck around you're actually finding yeah. that that movement of your spine where we and we just I will get be stuck. queuing I 
And I will be queuing that at the the keeping the head in line with the torso. Um, and yet, if you don't know you're doing it, but that's that's a lovely way of saying, actually, I can absolutely check because if I've completely gone off, then, yeah. you know, that angle's out, then I'm not doing it. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's superb. Yeah. yeah. So, so, um, so clever. It's really um, just reminding ourselves that if we can find the right cues that the brain needs, then we can really take charge of our own movement. And I think that's the biggest change for me with my teaching. I'm not having to get right in there and move limbs and give lots of cues. So then people find feel that they're more empowered. So they become, they take responsibility. And like you said, they feel that little change mm. and then they're encouraged to come back. You know, often I, I get people and, you know, they say, well, I think I might just have one session and then I'm going to go and do some things at home. But then if they find that, they, you know, something has significantly changed just by doing a small thing, then they're really keen. They want, want more. And so they're coming back <laughs> and, and they want to learn more. And that's the beauty because we can just keep, we, we found a strategy and we, we don't have to stick to that strategy, but we've got that way in. And then we just keep, we're challenging, 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 challenging. So I have this fuse ladder in my, my studio. It, it's a ladder against the wall and it's got kind of hanging bars on it. So I now have um, ladies in their seventies hanging from these bars, and they never thought that they could do that. But we've got there because we've worked through all these foundations and found the right cues for them, and it's it's really empowering. And just really, something, really empowering. Something as simple. Sorry, I feel like I'm banging on, but I'm really passionate about this. Something That's as simple. Why you're here. <laughs> As just going for a walk. Um, so one of my clients um, just felt like, you know, she's aging and she said, I can see all my friends getting a bit more stooped. And I don't want to be like that. Mm. But she's had various injuries and wasn't feeling confident on her feet. And she said she kept feeling that she was having to stop and she couldn't turn to the side really without feeling that she was losing her balance. So we again, like worked on opening up her visual field and also, um, People can get a little bit frustrated if you are a bit rounded, a bit hunched over, because most of the time, to be honest, we are, aren't we, over our phones and screens. Um, and then they're just being told to look up and then they just tend to try and look up Less from here that. and that, yeah. you know, it hurts. It's, it's not good. So rather than saying, well, you've got, you know, got to look up, try and stand up tall and, and they can't do it. But if we can open up the visual field so they're able to look down towards the floor without having to be hunched over, then they're not they're not having to look way ahead. They still need to be able to see their feet to feel safe. So they're able to look down, but by opening up that visual field, they're not having to drop their head to look down. So in that instance, for example, we could do one of those VR, uh, VORs where we're moving the head, keeping the eyes still, but working on the tracking or eye tracking down and up and we're going to incorporate that with movement so with that client for example the positive feedback there was oh, you know I'm going for long walks now and I feel steady and I'm not having to stop and kind of get my balance again so that's that's gentle. where it works and it's satisfying <laughs> and and I I love I I love um so I keep saying I love this because I do. <laughs> Me too. But, um, when, when I'm when I'm queuing um, balancing on a beam, which is obviously quite a, you know a slightly more advanced for a lot of people, mm. um, but a really really great feedback tool. Um, I'm just noticing the relevance of what I of some of the stuff I teach where I don't even realize quite how it's working, and that you've just you know yeah. um, educated me on, which is great. Where I say you know, head up because the head is weighing a lot, but actually try to use your eyes to look down. And, yes. and that is effectively asking people to open up that visual field, whether they can get to see their feet or not um, in balancing, particularly because you're not striding out in the same way. Yes. Different yeah, thing. Yeah. But but by understanding about the sort of asking for your, your body to be aligned well so that you're stacked nicely to help you balance, because often mm. part of the reason people feel 
um, that they're falling when they're walking is because their head's chasing forward and they're already on the fall. They're basically falling walking yeah. rather than being lovely and upright. But that's, as you say, it's because they want to see their feet to feel safe. Mm. Um, and if you can do that with your eyes and have, if that feels difficult, have this uh, method that you're talking about where you're opening it up, mm. then suddenly that's a whole new world, yeah. isn't there? And And often people will say, I, I can't do that any longer. There's a sort of a can't. And there's a feeling that things can't be undone because this is just progression and, uh, and, and the natural course of aging. And yet with techniques, with understanding the fact that walking is still a skill um, as you're sort of balancing each time that you take a mm. stride mm. and that your si sensory systems are involved in this and that you can improve them, then yeah. why not think, yeah. why not think that the world, you know, the world of opportunities yeah. will open up regardless of your age yeah and so, regardless of um physical limitations that they're coming to you with um people who've really thought that there was no hope and there is and that's just there's no mm, better gift as mm. i said before and the um walking as you say that's the ultimate balancing challenge isn't it so I often just give people a really simple weight shift exercise. So you can be looking at yourself in a your mirror or um, just stand and have a target. So you can do this as you're standing here now. Make sure you're on a target that isn't moving. And can you just shift yourself over to the right of that and over to the left of that? And keeping then, the spot in line yeah, as it were keep, you've got your your bullseye that your eyes are on you're going to keep looking yep. at that and you're going to shift over and back which you look like you're doing very well but some people might do that by um i'm trying to show this the best i can but you might see them leaning over with with their shoulders um, or you might see them kind so of actually picking up with the hip but they might, yeah, they might not know that they're not stacked. So then it's bringing some awareness to them, whether they're using a visual of looking at themselves, or maybe I'd say um, put your finger on the top of your pelvis there and your thumb up onto a rib. And now do your weight mm. shift and make sure you keep your finger and thumb in line. Distance. So, yeah, yeah. Your, everything is stacked and it, it's moving so going back to your point about being kind of mm. off off balance or maybe you know maybe the head is moving so I might say to them right go now okay move your just your head spill the tea out of that teacup we were talking about now can you move your head over without spilling any tea so you're going to keep it level now can you move your head and your ribs and your pelvis together just just to the right and left of that just working on that basic weight shift and then going back to walking, because this is another passion of um, mine, um, working on the push off part of walking. So just rather than um, kind of marching on the spot and doing all these things that not necessarily will help your walking, but breaking down those elements, for example, the push off, uh, what happens with your toes when you're lifting your heel to push off? So is the pressure changing? Are you pressing down through your toes? Are your toes scrunching under? Are they lifting off? So maybe let's give some more feedback to the toes. So at home or in my studio, put a little rolled up towel under the toes. Now, can you keep the same pressure under those toes as you lift the heel and lower? And that's getting that communication because we're focusing on that pressure not changing. That's going directly to your brain paying attention and that's getting the communication between your foot and your hip so now your hip is kind of responding to what your foot's doing now I never say to people think about that when you're walking because it's like if you start thinking about how you're walking you just can't walk <laughs> but yes. that, that would be one of their daily movement things that they work on at home do some seated or standing just heel lift but pay attention to the pressure that you feel under your toes so that's using a proprioceptive tool. Now, if I said that to you and you were like, okay, I'm lifting my heel and lowering heel, the pressure isn't changing in my toes. That's already integrated in your body. So that wouldn't be the right cue for you. But I might say to you, okay, can you do that heel lift and think about not spilling any of that tea in your head or do your heel lift without um, dropping down or above your target. So finding yes. the right cue for that person. Because like I said, everyone's brain is unique. 
what's going to work for you one day might not work for you on another day and it might not work for me but when you find it you know because you you feel that difference it's like everything's kind of slightly plugged in um everything's yeah. working together because you've got that control of your body that actually you haven't, yeah. you haven't particularly realized you're out of control but something's not felt right that that yeah. usual trigger of our sort of your gut's telling you you're not quite right, but you don't quite know what it is until you find it and then you realise what it was. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> with, and, with so many things in the body. <laughs> yeah, and not and not ignoring pain, as I'm, I'm sure you've come to realise as yeah. well, like not just working through pain. That That's the biggest communicator. That's your brain going, no, you need to stop this. And I think that's yeah. where I educate people quite a lot. They, they, I'm like, hmm, that looks like it's not comfortable for you. And they're grimacing. Yeah. No, it's okay. I've, I've got yes. to get through this. No, this is your brain telling you we need to find a different yeah. way. So let's stop. Let's let's yeah. try something different. Yeah, absolutely. And that's such a good point um, to end on as well because people really uh, there's such a culture of no pain, no gain. There's such yes. a culture of um, getting things. Um, you know, getting to the end result and, and everyone should push to get there rather than actually really respecting and responding to a body that, as you say, they're all utterly unique and we've got all our unique experiences of life and and therefore we need to respect that and respond to our bodies as they are rather than having such expectations that might never be met and uh, mm, you know mm. we're we're lucky to have what we have no matter our, our condition if we're here and um, and and then working towards better movement gently is the kindest way and probably yes. the most beneficial way that and the most going to get the better results the most effective but, yes and it makes me think yeah, of um, yeah. a client i had recently came in she's got quite severe scoliosis She's been to all sorts of practitioners, tried things, but still in pain. And uh, she said, oh, my God, I feel like I'm, I'm being really naughty because I said to her, right, where is it most comfortable for you to be, whether she was standing or lying on the mat? Right. Don't be like you're in a Pilates session with me. Can you just like turn to the right maybe a little bit? Now breathe here. How does that feel? Turn to the left, be in the center. We went through all of those. And it was so obvious to her every time. I think it was to the right, like, oh, okay, here feels good. So I said to her, right, stay there now. Now we're going to do, we might do a leg movement, an arm movement. And she said, well, I can be here. And um, <laughs> yeah, I said, yeah, because that's where yeah. your brain knows it's safe. Now, I'm not it's saying safe. we're going to leave her there forever. And we actually yeah. did some eye um, and eye and head movements to bring her from that right-sided angle to a more centered place by using that sensory information we were using in that case through the eyes because she was also she is also very hypermobile so proprioceptive cues were difficult for her and she was then more centered not because we'd forced her into a position but we showed her brain how she could get there Ah, oh, so fascinating <laughs> it really is uh, uh, and you know you know we've gone on longer than we thought we would that's uh, for sure because it is just it's just there's too much and and obviously I, as you can tell I could keep asking you questions for hours <laughs> um and yeah and ma and maybe there, there's something aside from here because there's just so much useful stuff in there so thank you so much for sharing everything you have because um I think especially when something's really practical hopefully people weren't driving for this episode so that oh, yes, they could stop and actually <laughs> stop and actually do the things but then they might listen to it twice to come back and go yeah I really wanted to do that test mm. that thing out so mm. that's so so helpful um giving people actual examples um and, and I'll be listening again to check them myself <laughs> so listen if anyone um wants to find you and get in touch um then where where can they find you Yes, so and my website is kemppilates.com. That's K-E-M-P-P-I-L-A-T-E-S. I do work with people virtually, so all of this can be done really effectively. Like I said, because I'm not kind of hands-on manhandling people, mm. I'm giving people that responsibility, helping them. I, as I say it's a bit like being a good parent, really. You're not kind of on top of them. You're allowing them to explore, yeah. and I'm just guiding 
So that can be done just as well, work with people virtually. Um, I'm on Instagram, Kemp Pilates. I'm not very good at posting very often. <laughs> Must be better on that. Uh, but yeah, you can you can find me um, there. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for your time and your expertise, um, mm-hmm. and and for delving deeper into into a world that uh, I knew much less about, and I'm really glad to know a lot more about now. So, thank you for your time. Oh, thank you. It's been lovely talking to you. I hope you've enjoyed listening and if you have, you can help by doing three things. First, press the follow button to tell podcast platforms you want to listen again. Second, please give the show a five star rating and leave a review about why you liked it. And third, I'd love you to share it with friends and family or on your socials, for which I'm truly thankful. Finally, if this podcast is making you want to start reclaiming your own movement, Join me in the Reclaim Movement membership for classes, both live and by replay, and countless videos of mini movement breaks to add into your daily life, covering practical and fun, important natural movements. Visit reclaimmovement.co.uk forward slash membership to get started with your seven day free trial. See you for the next episode and thank you so much for listening.